I want to share something, Let me, and, and as a way of introducing into this, I want to talk to you about some of the, the miracles that we have witnessed quite recently. And the miracles, I, I wouldn't even waste your time about talking about in and toenails and such things. I want to talk to you about real miracles that we have witnessed over the last several months, during the summer holidays in particular. Uh, we were down in Cork, Laura and I was down in Cork l last month. When we were down, we had got to the end of the praise and worship as a guy, just like, just like Paul here gets up, plays a guitar, does a fantastic job. He had just finished as usual. I had stepped up to the platform just to, to start. And, and this guy who is normally a very shy, an introvert man, he real, wouldn't say boo to the fly. You'd really never hear from him. He would just come in and go. And suddenly between me going to preach and the music just stopped and this guy stood to his feet and shouted, I've got a talent. I've got a talent. I've got a talent. And, and he looked at me for permission, you know, and I said, all right, all right, what are you going to say? What are you going to say? He said, let me tell you, he says, last month, that was July, when you were down here, he said, you and Laura came, and he says, I came for prayer for a girl called Kelly. Kelly had just been diagnosed as having a new brain disease called ADEM. I've never heard of it, but this is what they tell me, that uh, it's, a new, it's a new disease called ADEM, that she was completely paralyzed in a coma. She had to be tube-fed. And because of the virus or this ADEM that was uh, working against her brain, she was so brain damaged that the doctors made this the, the statement. They said to her, to her people, to her parents, they said, we're sorry, but your daughter will never, ever make a recovery. We have nothing, we have nothing on our books that can deal with your daughter. She's in a coma. We don't know when she's going to come out of it. And such is the effects of being paralyzed, exactly with the brain damage. We don't think she'll ever be anything uh, like what you would call normal. And he said, but I've got a talent. I've got a talent. He said, I came here in July. And he said, just laid hands and prayed. And Kelly was in a coma. He said, I want to tell you within 48 hours, Kelly was no longer in a coma. But Kelly sat up. And, he, and the doctor said, because I had her monitored, doctor said this, said that the brain damage, there's no longer traces of the brain damage. It said it was like, it was like electricity went around her, and her arms was the first thing to move. Her hands began to reflect her muscles in her legs, and she said, help me up, help me up, and they stood her to her feet. She took, they didn't have to feed her through the tube that was feeding her anymore. The tubes are down. She's on her feet. She's laughing, and she's talking. She's all, almost back to normality. And let me tell you something. The doctors, the doctors in the Cork Regional Hospital said this statement, told her parents, said, we'll put it in writing if you like. They said, it's absolutely nothing that we have done that sudden and unexpected recovery is nothing, absolutely nothing to do with the medicine or the treatment we have been given. They said, we don't understand why. Look at somebody say, but we do. What do we do? I'm telling you, I'm standing listening to this. That man is just trying to get his breath back. And another woman, she stood up and she says, I got to tell it to you. I got to tell it to you. I said, well, go ahead, girl. She says, a friend of mine, I brought her to the meeting. And she said, she's like a zombie. She has a mental illness that was serious depression with it. And she said, from she was a teenage girl. She said, she just lost it all together. She'd walk around in a daze. She's such on heavy duty medication. She'd walk around like a zombie. And they said, the last time she went to hospital a few weeks ago they had to give her electric shock treatment to stop the cycle in her head and in her brain and they said she said and I walked her out of hospital and the girl had to be physically helped from that day forward and he said we brought her to the meeting in July and in July she said when she went home that night she came into the meeting to see him she went out of the meeting to see him but she said in the middle of the night look at somebody say in the middle of the night and here is her testimony. In the middle of the night, the whole thing left her. The whole thing left her. She said it was a cloud that disappeared. It was a darkness that just gripped her and from her teenage years. And she said this. She says, my friend, is as seeing as you and I. I'm not sure about some of you, but let me tell you. She said, this, she said, this woman said she's back to normality again. I said, man, I with my hair was on fire. My fingers were tingling. I said, dear God, and I stood in that meeting and I was laying hands on people in that meeting and God was doing the most fantastic. Look at somebody say, fantastic. 
absolutely fantastic. There was another woman in that meeting who had a, a vascular problem, a heart disease problem. And because of that, her legs, her thighs had swollen up. And one in particular had swollen up. And her testimony was she said, I thought the skin was going to burst. But thigh was swollen up and it was tight. It was, you know, with the fluid. And she said, it was right up. She says, to you guys pray it. And she said, right there and then instantly, the swelling went down and the legs come back to normal. I thought, my goodness me. We used to hear about miracles once a year, but now we're hearing them on a regular basis. And this was just July. Several nights ago, I had to go down in an emergency run down to Dublin. A, a pastor friend uh, called me and said, could you come down? I, I need to talk to you. And so Laura and I went down, and while we were sitting, there were several other people come in to that uh, the house where we were sitting just to talk some things through. And while we were sitting, there was a little girl come in. She was a teenager, about 13, 14-year-old girl, but she's a Down syndrome girl. And, and she, was, she was laughing and stuff going through, and, and uh, I didn't have time to talk to her or see what was going on. You know, she just passed it through there. And when she did, and I was talking to these pastors, the lady, the mummy, which was the pastor's wife of this young girl, sat down beside, beside my wife, Laura, and said, Laura, she says, three years ago, she says, you and your husband came to our church and you prayed for everybody. And she said, you prayed for my daughter in particular. And she says that that night, my daughter was Down syndrome, she said, but she could not walk. She could not walk. We had to carry her everywhere, carry her to the car, out of the car. Had to have a special buggy pram made for her because of the size of her. We had to carry her into bed and carry her out of bed. She says, let me tell you. She says, that night after the meeting, when we went home and her daddy had her sitting on his knee and said, come on, honey, I will go to bed. And she turned around him and said, no, daddy, I'll help myself. And she got down off his knee and she walked up the stairs herself. And she said, Laura Corey, she says, for the last, let me tell you, she said, for the last three years, for the last three years, she says, my daughter has been doing all the walking herself. She says, if God can do that, she's troubled with her speech. And she says, if God can do that, God can do the speech also. My goodness me, she wasn't long and turned around and said, Laura, would you pray for her now that you're here? So we'll stop the whole discussion. you got to understand there's three Down syndrome, that's the fourth Down syndrome miracle we've had. We've had three Down syndrome miracles where three babies were diagnosed in the womb, in the womb, as fully Down syndrome children, monitored the whole way, special attendance there at the delivery date. For to, bring, for to bring forth these uh, uh, these uh, Down syndrome babies, three different ones in three different locations, and all three, when they arrived, was perfectly normal without any defects. I'm telling you something, God is on the move. Look at somebody say, God is on the move. My goodness, back came home and I, got, I was in Bristol several uh, weeks ago and I got an email back from a guy over there who had also been in the meeting and he said his wife was waiting for, uh, she had had chronic back pain for, for, uh, for many, many years and she was now lined up to have surgery on her back and he said somewhere in the midst of that meeting, he said, I don't even think he's prayed for my wife, but somewhere in the midst of that meeting, God touched her spine. And he said, we're, we're able to phone up and cancel the operation. He said, my wife is walking, she's running, she's jogging, and she's dancing. Says up until that, she was on a walking aid and couldn't move anywhere and waiting for an operation. Look at somebody say, isn't God fantastic? Yes, he is. And we're not talking about Ethiopia, India, America. We're talking Ireland, man. Do you hear this? Look at somebody say, he's talking about Ireland. I'm talking on this island that you and I live in. God himself is doing a business in Ireland. If he can do it north, he can do it south, east, or west. And location is really nothing to him. He can do it anywhere. My goodness me. I told you that first of all, to muster your faith, to bolster your faith, so that you can begin to look from where you are right now, whatever obstacle limitation is in your road. I have just told you testimonies. I've, uh, there's more. I can stand here and I just read you off testimonies. But I, I'm telling you the testimonies so that you'll get your level of faith up and say, well, wait a minute, if God can do that, for sure God can do this. I'm trying to take the misery or the fear or the limitations of where you are so that you'll understand something, that it doesn't have to end the way the devil says it will, that life doesn't have to end this way, but there's a greater day. Look at somebody say there's a greater day. So let's get down to the business in hand tonight. I want to read you from the Gospel of John chapter 5. John chapter 5, I want to get through this real quick because right now I'm feeling that I need to lay hands on everybody that moves and breathes and squeals. Is that all right? 
I may not even get, oh, I can feel it rising in my, why, goodness me, John chapter 5, I'm praying, Holy Spirit, look, you don't really need me. I, I, I'm delighted that, that I get to lay hands on people. I think that's absolutely wonderful. And a, it's a privilege and an honor. But I, I just want to say that you don't need me. You don't need me to be laying hands on people. I, I'm glad to be doing it, but I need to tell it to you again. You don't need me. You, you, you can do it. You can do it right now. You can do it while we're preaching, while we're talking. You could be bouncing up and down spines. You could remove cancers. You could make hair begin to grow on the top of people's head again. You could move gross. You could take cartilages and move them around. You could, you could open a blind eye. You could move a shut eye. You, you can do it. You can do it. Please don't be limited by me, Holy Spirit. Don't be limited by me. I'm just Joe. You're unlimited. You're the business, Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. John chapter 5 and verse 2. Now there was at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue in Bethsaida, because it had five porches. And uh, in these they lay a, multi uh, a multitude of important folk, uh, blind, halt, withered, uh, waiting for the movement of the water. For it was said, an angel went down at certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Now, whosoever then was first after the, tr the water was troubled to step in, they would be made whole of whatever disease they had. Now, a certain man was there that had an infirmity. Everybody shout infirmity. That had an infirmity 38 years. It's a long time. 38 years. Now, when Jesus saw him lie, and Jesus knew that he had been in that case for a long time, he said unto him, Will you be made whole? And the important man answered him and said, Sir, I, 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 I have no man. And when the water's troubled to put me down into the pool, and while I'm getting ready or just coming to go into that water, another one steps down before me. And Jesus answered him and said, Arise, check up your bed, and walk. Then listen to the man's excuses. The man's reason just cut straight to the chest. Arise. Look at somebody say, Arise. Check up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and he took up his bed and he walked on the same day it was the Sabbath. I, uh, had, I, I got many preacher friends, all types, all shapes, all descriptions, some of them fantastic. Some of them miracle workers, some of them do major crusades. I had a long conversation with one who spent some time with. He's a bishop. Spent some time with him and began to share stories. This was several years ago. And uh, he said, Joe, did I ever tell you the one the time I was in Jamaica doing the crusades? And he said, I got a phone call in the night. I said, no, I, I didn't hear that one. He said, well, I, I was doing a crusade. He says, there's thousands of people was coming to the Lord in, in every night in their crusades. And he said, it was the second night and I got back to the hotel. And he said, I got a very unexpected phone call. He said, it's one of them phone calls you never really want to hear. He says, but there was a, a, a message in, uh, from the other side, and it said, uh, your daughter, Lindsay, has been rushed to hospital. She lives in America. But he said, your daughter, Lindsay, has been rushed to hospital. And the doctor said that they don't expect her to make it through to the morning. He said, Joe, I don't think you can realize what it's like to be thousands of miles away from home to have no way of getting an aeroplane or a bus or a train out of the country to get back. And they're told that within hours that your daughter will never see the daylight or a sunshine in her life again, that she'll die. He said, it's like a, a, a fist that hits you. And he said, I dropped to my knees. And he said, I wept and I wept and I wept. And he said, I lay prostrate for a long time before the Lord. And I called on the name of the Lord. And he said, I kind of pulled myself together and I sat up in a kneeling position and I said, Lord, he said, you're greater than any problem. You're greater than any dilemma. You're greater than anything I've saw you doing things over the years. And he said, my daughter is young. And he said, she has a whole life to live. And he said, you have made this statement. He said, it doesn't have to end this way. Look at somebody say, it doesn't have to end this way. He said, Joe, I find myself saying these words. It doesn't have to end this way, Lord. The final chapter of her pages of life has not yet been written. And of course, it could be written now with a full stop. He said, but I don't think so. He said, you're a great God. You're a mighty God. You're a wonderful God. And he said, I'd like to write something on the pages of her book, of the book of life. And he said, I'd like to write it. It doesn't have to end this way. He said, I kept whispering it. It doesn't have to end this way, Lord. 
It doesn't have to end this way, Lord, he said, until I fell asleep exhausted. And he said, I woke asleep just as the dawn was rising. And he said, I got a phone call. And he said, I answered it quickly. And he said, another voice saying, the doctors have just left Lindsay's room. And they said, somewhere between 4.30 and 5 o'clock this morning, there was a sudden and dramatic turnaround. And they said that whatever was had hit your daughter, they said it won't be at the end of her. They, this is what they said. They said they expect her to make a full, a, a full recovery. And they said, sir, they said, you don't have to fly home. You don't have to fly home. Just carry on doing the crusades. He said, Joe Corey, he says, I'll never forget it. He says, there's many a prayer you pray. He said, but I'll never forget that this one line. It doesn't have to end this way. I was thinking that over the other day, that one line, when I was beginning to figure some stuff out where I was going to preach and talk to people. And I couldn't get past that one line. It doesn't have to end this way. See, if I was to take this microphone right now and walk around this room, I'm sure and certain there'd be all types of testimonies, people here that could tell us about the first 10, the first part of, of your, your life, uh, about the tears and the, and the rejection that you went through. There's other people here, and you could tell us about for the first part of your life, how there was habits and addictions that controlled your life. There'd be other people in this room and you could tell us maybe about, about where you were 10 years ago and if you told us where you were and what you looked like and what you were up to 10 years ago, there's people in this room would turn around and say, never, it couldn't be him. Look at him now. Look at somebody say, look at me now. There's people in this room and you'd say, no, no, it couldn't be you. Look at you, you're too healthy looking. Look at you, you got a business. Look at you, you got a wife and 105 children. Couldn't be you. But there's people in this building and I want to tell you something. If you really knew who they were and what they were 10 years ago, you'd be surprised. There's some in here, many ended up doing prison, time in prison. There's some that's maybe got hospital stories. There's some in here with broken relationship stories and broken marriage stories. And it looked like that the time it was the end. There may even be people in this building tonight that several years ago that you were on the verge or the brink of suicide. Maybe, there's, maybe you still today have the scars to, to prove it. But let me tell you, you have this one statement that it didn't turn out the way that the enemy or life had planned it. Look at somebody say it didn't end that way. But there's a time in your life when you thought it would. There was a time in your life when you sat with your head in your hands and you thought you'd never meet the bill. You could never meet somebody. Nobody would ever fall in love with you. You could never love again. You'd never get a job. Ten years, twelve years, five years ago, life was different for you. Life was entirely different. But you have a testimony tonight. It didn't have to end that way. Maybe you had a real poor beginning. Maybe you were one of them teenagers in their teenage years and you got up what we would call rebellious. Maybe you just full of hate when you were young. Maybe you hated everybody and hated society and were against everybody and you couldn't make life work for you. Maybe you come to that place and you just thought, Ma, what's the use? You were abused, walked on, overlooked, put down, isolated, insecure and alone. But look at you and I. Look at somebody say, look at you and I. Here you are, some dramatic changes as second place. And I don't want you to forget this one statement that it doesn't have to end that way. But life always looks for the ways where the difficulties and the problems are. It likes to label you as called stigma. It likes to look for your weaknesses and your failures. And we haven't found one that's sticking on you like a label that glows in the night and tells you you're a nobody, you're insignificant, you're rebellious, you're, and, and, and puts this stigma on you. But I, I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't have to end that way. It, this, this meeting can change some things. There's labels can come off you. There's life can, turn, can dramatically change if you can just give the Lord 10 seconds and you can give him a bit of a chance to work through you. You do not have to label your future nor the rest of your life by the mistakes and the failures that you've already made. Everybody in this room has made dramatic mistakes, have made failures, have made the wrong decisions. But the good news is we were able to get out of it it didn't end the way that at first thought. You need to think about that today because that's where we're going. God is going to take your future and turn it around and put it in the right direction. It's almost like he's going to give you a fresh start. It's a new start this night. And some of that baggage you've come in with, you won't have to go home with it. God himself will take care of business tonight. Because there's a man in his land for 38 years out of poodle, and he's waiting for one second of time that they said only come round every now and then 
Rumor had it that when the waters would ripple, you could get in and you could get healed. I doubt it very much, but nevertheless, they, uh, the, the, the word was used to describe this man's uh, inabilities, uh, disabilities was a word called infirmity. And uh, 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 recently I did a whole teaching about the spirit of infirmity. This has nothing to do with it. But I looked again at that word infirmity to see exactly what it meant. I have several terminologies that I read when I was dealing with illnesses and long-term sicknesses. But looking at it from a different aspect, this word infirmity, and I looked at it from other definitions that I have, and I found this one. And it means it's something that puts restraints or limitations upon your potential. In other words, the man had his arms, his brain, his head, his eyes, but his legs didn't work. So he could never run a race. He could never live his life to the maximized potential. He could never do what he was born to do. And sometimes your faults and your failures, and life in particular, can put a restraint, a limitation on your potential. So you never rise to the person you're supposed to be. You never have a go. You never make a try. If you failed once, you'd probably say that was too hurtful, so I'll not even make a stab at it again. Then nobody will ever know who you really are. Nobody will never know what you were born to do or what you were called to change. Look at somebody say, you look awesome to me. I tell you, I was got a, a call, and we wouldn't often do this, but when I got a call to people that lived in Dublin, pastors, and they signed a gen of distress, and so Laura, I said to Laura, come on, we'll go. And it took us an hour and three quarters to find where they lived. We found it. We got there. And uh, I, I, we, we had a little bit of conversation. They invited other people around. It turned out next thing to a meeting. They wanted me to prophesy to everybody who was there. But anyway, the main thing at hand was to deal with him. And I said, what is your problem, sir? And he said, for the last 10 years, he said, I've given my life. I've given my heart and my soul. I've given everything to build this up. And he said, all I ever get is ridiculed and put down. If I come up with a suggestion, it's laughed at. If I say we can do this, they say, no, you can't. And he says, for 10 years, several times I said I'll resign. But then they change. He says, I'll stay. I'll stay. So he says, then out of a goodness heart, I'll stay. And then off it goes again. He says, 10 years. He said, I just need a word from God. Is it time for me to pull out? I said, adios, amigo. Look at somebody. Look at somebody say, adios, amigo. <laughs> He said to me, I just need a word from God. I said, you don't need a word from God, sir. I said, you're living in the midst of hell when you're not supposed to be. I said, let me ask you a simple question. If you knew you had two years to live, if you knew you had two years to live, would you remain in that place? Would you keep doing what you're doing? He said, not for one more second. I said, why? He says, because I've never got to do what I've really meant to do. I've never really explored who I really am. I said, you've just answered the question yourself. While you stick in that place, you will never be anybody. You'll never know what you can do. You'll never sprout wings and fly. You'll live and die on nobody. I said, but sir, if you'll pack your bags and you'll say adios amigo, God will open a door. And I, I said, I have a vision. I have a vision. Look at somebody say, he had a vision. I said, I, here's what I see. I see you standing like a warrior. I said, have you ever seen that, that, that movie Zulu? Anybody here ever saw Zulu? You ever saw that there? Uh, and, they, and the Zulu warriors stand around the top of the mountain, and there's the British army down there. They're standing here in their tens of thousands, and they lift their sword in the sheet, and they go, hoo, hoo, hoo. And this, you ever seen that? Makes the hair on the back of your neck stand, and these boys down here singing some Welsh song. I'm telling you something. No, I'm telling you, a good tell them, go out and buy it. It's worth the watching. But here they are. I said, sir, I see a vision. I see you standing on the mountain like a warrior. I see you've got a spear, and I see you've got a shield. And I said, you're looking down onto the crowd below. And I said, they're warriors. And they've got shields and they've got spears. And I said, I see you, sir. You're standing up and you're shouting. It's our time. We can take the nation. And you go, hoo, hoo, hoo. And this crowd goes. So you say it again. We can do it. We're mighty men. This is our time. This is our nation. We can do it. Let's do it. And you go, hoo, hoo, hoo. And he looks down to these warriors, and they're all going. And he said, here's what I see, sir. Here's what I see. They have the ability, but they're not doing it. You know you can do it, but you've not got a chance. I said, while I'm, what? while I'm talking to you, the vision is changing. And I said, there's two sides to every mountain. 
You're on the top and you're looking this side. And I said, you turn this way and there's another multitude over here and they're also warriors and they've also got spears and they've also got shields. So you turn around to them with the same voice and the same dialogue and you said, this is our time. We can take this nation. <laughs> and this whole bunch goes. <laughs> I said, sir, how fast can you get out of where you are? Because there's a multitude waiting, and if you stick with this bunch, they'll bury you on the top of the mountain, and we'll never get to read your book. We'll never know who you really were. Look at somebody say, you don't know who I am. Of course I don't. That's why I'm come. I come to string your bow, baby. I come to lighten your world. I come to tell you, you are chic, handsome, demoneer, and wonderful. Hallelujah. Look at somebody say, this man's good. You ain't got to understand this, because if you never try, you'll never know. All of them dreams on the inside, and you've not even attempted, because you looked at somebody else who tried and failed, but maybe it wasn't in them to do it. You'll never know till you have a go. You'll never know till you take the first step. The Bible, or the, the history books, tells us about a man called Captain Cook who discovered Australia. It was there all along. He just happened to bump into it. But nevertheless... But nevertheless, when he discovered Australia, and he died on the shores of Australia, and they buried him on the shores, and they put up a large tombstone with this engraving on the tombstone that said, Here lies a man that, leaves no that left nothing unattempted. I think I'd like that. I think I'd like something like that, rather than that there just Joe. He spent 30 years talking the same talk to the same bunch of people. I don't think that's me. I'd like it that here lies a man that left nothing unattempted. If there was a chance out of he took it, he seized the moment. Look at somebody say, seize the moment. But I meet men and women up and down this island. I'm not interested in the rest of the world. They got other preachers. This is my land. This is my island. If you listen to me, I'm talking to you tonight. I meet people up and down this island, and all they tell you when I tell you, you can do it, you can do it, they hand me a list of excuses. Because the man at the side of the pool, when Jesus said to them, do you want to live like this forever? Do you want to live like this forever? It doesn't have to end this way. Do you want me to help you? And this man immediately went down to start out a whole list of stuff as to why he couldn't get help. Well, I got nobody's nobody to help me. They're helping him and they're helping her, but there's no I went down a list. I have noticed this about folk. When you go to tell them God can, they start to give you a list of, a r list of reasons why it can't happen to them. I, I, I don't have any money. I don't have any time. I'm not well educated. I'm bald. I'm hairy. I'm thin. I'm fat. I'm, I'm ugly. I'm nice. They give you a list. They give you a list. Did you not notice when Jesus was talking to the man, he didn't say, give me a list of why you can't do it. He just asked them one question. Do you really want to? Look at somebody say, do you really want to? Because I find in this race of life, you've got to really want to. But if you're prepared to go and to do, you'll, you'll take this thing by storm. I have endeavored over the last 30 years of ministry never to put down, talk down, or discourage a single human being. But my, my, my ethos in life is to cause people to go to the next level, whatever it takes. And I've always looked for messages and sermons and looked for the, for the most optimistic side of it, looked for a way to encourage people up rather than look down at them. And recently I was listening to the news, and it was actually on Radio Ulster, but I, I, was, I was just getting into the car, just switched it on as the end of it was coming, and they mentioned the guy called David Skies. And then they had said about a record he had just broken. And I thought, what do you call that guy? So I wrote it down, David Skies. And I went home, I went on the internet, and I wrote up David Skies, and an up and coming. Here's David Skies' story. In 1993, he uh, was on his way to work on a motorbike, and he broke his back severely. He was wheelchair-bound. He broke both legs, broke all his ribs, two punctured lungs, loss of feeling in his right arm, and a 30% survival rate, and hospitalized for six months. But David Skies decided it doesn't have to end this way. Look at somebody say, it doesn't have to end this way. He said, I know I'm in a wheelchair, but I don't have to end up wheelchair bound. I don't have to, my life doesn't stop because I have to push four wheels rather than to run on two legs. And so he, when he got out of the hospital and got back, he signed up with a parachute club and he made a skydive and he thought, wow, we, this is fantastic, but it's not fast enough. So he decided he would design a faster chute. He designed a faster chute which didn't open. 
until he was closer to the ground than first expected. And when he landed this time, he broke his legs and was put back in the hospital. Did that deter him? Did that put this guy down? Absolutely no way, Jose. Instead, whenever he got his legs back and got himself fully recovered, he built himself a micro light that the wheelchair could, could, could strap onto the side of the micro light. And he has just finished a round the world tour flight. A round the world flight on a micro light. That's like a motorbike with wings. Have you ever seen one of them things? He has just concluded, and it's, he's the only man to have done this record since 1947. When a woman, look at somebody say, a woman? When a woman broke the world record, made a world record by the, being the first woman to fly solo round the thing, 1947. Now nah, he just broke it. He didn't have to. He could have laid back and got the disability allowance and got himself a better, got himself a better wheelchair, and one with wings on the set. He could have been picking up the dole and, and getting nice letters, write a book about how sore it was and how the pin didn't fit and how your bleeper went off going through the scanners in an air pit because you got more, you got more uh, uh, screws in your body than a, than a joiner has in a toolbox, you know? But he didn't. Look at somebody say he didn't. He didn't succumb to the normal. Instead, he decided, wait a minute, life's worth living. And he rose to the challenge. And I want to tell you something. I think you can write to the challenge. I think there's something inside you that refuses to die till you've seen the best of what God wants to do for you. Don't ever give God a list of excuses and reasons because reasons, is that's all it is. It's excuses. If all you ever give is a list of excuses why you can't, then you'll never do it. I tell you, rip that, rip that paper up that you're writing and start to give God a list of, a list of why you think you should. Amen. I wrote this down for my benefit, not for yours, but it's good preaching, so I'll tell it to you anyway. It's never, listen, it's never too late for a fresh start. Look at somebody say, it's never too late for a fresh start. There was a man in the Old Testament called Joshua. Joshua was the guy who took over after Moses. Now, his story is this. Forty years he spent in a desert in a wilderness because somebody else made a decision for him one day. Somebody else's error, somebody else's unbelief, and for the next 40 years, he ends up walking through a wilderness. Isn't it funny that only him and another guy and a handful of people made it out when the rest of them died in the wilderness? And I can tell you why he made it when the rest didn't. Because he said, I may have to walk this because of somebody else's unbelief, but that unbelief is not inside me. And I don't care how long it takes. And I don't care how long I have to wait. Well, one of these days I'm getting out of here. Look at somebody say, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> one of these days I'm going to go on a cruise. Look at somebody say, sign me up, baby. One of these days I'm going to see Alaska. One of these days I'm going to Toronto on a pushback. One of these days he was walking 40 years. For, wasn't his fault. Wasn't his fault. But he was prepared to wait whatever length of time it took until one day his opportunity came. I was reading this scripture. And of all the years I've read, never saw this one to the other day. That's what I'm telling you about it. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 30. It starts off telling you about Joshua being called. It goes through the whole the next 24 chapters about the, about the fighting and the round he had to go through. He made a decision, I'm not sitting here. I'm going to find my destiny in God. We get to the last chapter, the last verses of the Bible, of his book. And here's what it says in Joshua 24, verse 30. And they buried him in the borders of his inheritance. Here's what he says. I didn't have to die in the wilderness. Look at somebody say, it doesn't have to end this way. No, no, he said, you can die in the wilderness if you want, but I'm going on. And the Bible says they buried him right on the very extremities, on the very limits of his inheritance. In other words, he walked the length and breadth of everything that God promised him. I want to tell you something, if you're not dead, there's still a promise on the inside of you. You're not here by an accident or mistake. You were planned by Almighty God. There's something that only you can do, only you can finish. If you don't do it, somebody else will have to, but it'll never turn out the same. You are a rarity. You are special. You are unique. And you are here on a mission and an assignment. We have got to find out who you are, pat you in the back and release you to finish your course. Joshua for 40 years walked the wilderness, but one day he said by hook or by crook, my time will come. And when my time comes, adios amigo, and I'm going. And the Bible says he made it. 
He made it out of the wilderness. He made it out and he walked the whole borders of his inheritance. He got to fulfill his destiny. I guarantee you when he standed in chapter 24, verse 30 on the last days, when he standed on the very last step of his, of his destiny, and he stands there and he said, let me tell you, it was tough. Look at somebody say, it was tough. It was tough, but I made it. It was tough, but I made it. I had to fight giants. I had to do three jobs. I had to do night shift. I had to take a course at the tack. I had to go back to school. I had to walk across rivers. I had to defeat walled cities. But I didn't die in a wilderness. I made it to the borders of my promise in God. Look at somebody say, there's a promise for me. I'm getting excited now. You're getting excited with me. See, I mean, most people, and they're limited, and their life is limited. They, they never hear this type of message, and they get all excited for a moment. They think maybe it's possible. I'm here to tell you it is. All you need is somebody to shiver you along, give you the right opportunities, and back you, and you can do it. But I meet people all the time just like you, marked with hindrances and disappointments and letdowns and frustrations and heartaches. You could go and buy the books in the Christian bookshop about it make you cry just reading their stories and heartaches. Heartache stories are wonderful if you want to cry a bit, but that's not your destiny. That's just stuff you have to go through to get to where you're going. Sooner or later, you're going to have to put away the hankies and the tears, and you're going to have to move on from where you... Look at somebody say, move on. You're going to have to move up and move on. I, I know this. I'm 56 years of age. I know I don't look it, but that's the way it is. I... <laughs> didn't David encourage himself in the Lord? I'm just doing the same thing with uh, nobody else in my childhood. So I got to tell it to myself. I don't care. I have the odd moment on my own, so you got to forgive me. But understand, I, am I helping anybody here? Gee, night, I thought I was on my own there for a minute. Not 56 years of age, but I know this for sure. I haven't preached my best message. This one's better than the last one. The one before that was not as good as that one. You know what I'm saying? But I want to tell you something. I haven't preached my last message. And my destiny's not finished. And I haven't went to everywhere I'm supposed to go. I haven't released all the leaders that I need to release. I haven't won all the people I'm supposed to read to, 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 to lead to the Lord. I want to tell you something. So it's not time for me to die. When there's breath inside me, I will refuse to settle where I am. I'm always looking for the next height, the next doorway, the next opportunity. I'm quick to seize the opportunity, no matter where I'm laid, because when you get there, you might find there's a greater door than you ever expected. If you sit at home watching Carnation Street, you'll remember the theme tune, but life will pass you by. And understand this, life is short. Look at somebody say, life is short. And I don't care when you get to 70 and 80 years of age. And I don't care what the dream is in your heart. I know a lot of people say, well, I'm raising the kids and I'll wait till they're all grown up and then I'll do this. When you get to that time, you never do it. You never do it. And the one two may be there, but now all of a sudden you don't have the legs to do it. You don't have the strength to do it. It's not there anymore. The time to do it is now. The time to do it is now. You gotta make a stab at it. You gotta get up. You'd be surprised when you get up and get going what things happen to you. Joshua had a sidekick called Caleb. Have you ever heard of Caleb? Caleb was of the same, the same uh, makeup. He was of the same. He must have come from Belfast as well. I'm telling you, this this, this guy had huh? Caleb purposed in his heart 40 years walking the same wilderness as Joshua. My goodness me. They probably give each other a high five every lunchtime and say, one of these days we're out of here. Not complaining about the weather or the storm or the, or the cook town, but turning around and saying, hey, boy, I tell you, have you heard any words yet? <laughs> Always waiting on their opportunity to come. He's 85 years old. He's, 80, he's no checking. He's 85 years old when the opportunity for greatness came to him. 85, most people's looking for another retirement home or somewhere to move from a little hovel to a shovel. They're already on their way out. If they're self-figured out, I'm the last in a long list. Okay, this guy wasn't 85. He got to the top of the mountain, to the very borders of his inheritance. He stood there 45 years before that, stood there and said, this is mine. But he was denied it. God said, I can't give it to you. The whole bunch of other people made a decision for you. And for 40 years, he walks the wilderness. He studies 85 years of age. He's now standing at the borders of his inheritance. And he didn't turn around and say, okay, where's the best nursing home around here? I can get myself into it. Get me one way up here. I can just overlook the inheritance and sit there and look at them every morning and say, 
No, 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 no. He said, no, no, don't get me my slippers and my pipe. Look at somebody say, don't bring me my slippers. Oh, no, sorry. Give me my goodies. <laughs> See, young people don't even know what goodies are. Give me them Nikes and my trainers and my Pumas. I might need two or three of them. I may be 85 on the outside, but I'm a rascal on the inside. Just cut her down, let her loose, unplug me, untie me. And he said, I refuse to die until I've had at least, at least one go on it. Look at somebody say, I'm not dying until I get one go. Come on. Some of us never did ride that Ferris wheel in the middle of the big eye in the middle of, of Belfast. You need to track it to Cardiff and go and do it. Some of you never did do cartwheels down the, down the hill at Scrabble Tower. Go ahead and do it. <laughs> Just make sure it's dark and nobody's watching you. All right. You can take ten killers afterwards. But you got to do something with your life. You can't lie back and rust. Come on, you can do it. Look at somebody say you're not bad as well. Listen. Joseph. Do you remember Joseph? Here's what Joseph wrote. So Genesis 50 and verse 25. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel. Now he's dying at this point. He gathered the people around him. He says, promise me, promise me, promise me. He grabbed them by the lapels, got them real close and said, promise me. He said, promise me. God will surely visit you. And you shall carry my bones from hence. Promise me. God told me that he'll visit this nation and all Israel will be, all, all Israel will be free. This, this nation will not hold us. We're coming out, boys. We're coming out. He said, I'm too old now. I'm not going to see it. But I'll tell you what. You see, when you go, I still want to go with you. So when I go, put my bones in the fridge. Learn something. Oh, don't even bother. Put, my, put me in the fridge freezer. Get me in and out. He said, don't you dare bury me. Put me up and smoke what He said, you make sure you freeze dry me. And he says, put me somewhere you can get at me in a hurry. And he said, let me tell you something. When God visits you, he said, I will not stay in this land when God's doing something up there. So he said, you make sure when you go, hack me in your rucksack and check me with you. Look at somebody say, check me with you. He's so excited about it. He ran his wheels, but he knew it's not finished. Some of you got finished when you're 26. You married him. And you stand and then I said, you thought, well, I'll sit now. I'll just be the rest of the days, I'll be cooking bacon and eggs, and I'll just be doing this here, and I'll have a few children, and that'll be it. And you stop living. I'm here to tell you, get a life. You're not meant to die at 26. You're only starting to live. And you've got a husband love him with all your life, fatten him up with sausage, bag and eggs, of course. But there's holidays you've never taken. There's exotic places you've never walked. There's things you never talked about. There's books you never read. And there's things you were born to do. Come on, get a grip on life and start making plans. Look at somebody say, I'm going to make a plan. And Joseph had this in his things. He said, God will visit us. And I'm telling you, if I'm alive, fantastic. But even if I'm dead, I'm out of here. I am out of here. I'm almost finished. I'm not running out of breath. I'm just almost finished. What I'm going to say, I'm feeling like I need to lay hands on a whole bunch of people in about 30 seconds. In that strange, when you, when, you, when you read the life of, of the Lord Jesus, and especially on the last days of his earthly ministry, just before he went to the cross, when you read it, if you ever take a notice to the people that he actually stood to talk to and the people that he spent a few moments with on his journey to the cross, if you, if you stop to, to analyze it, you'll find there's one guy called Zacchaeus. Do you remember Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a, a businessman, a businessman extraordinaire. He had to have the job, but he also had to be one of the biggest con artists and, and one of the biggest cowboy, cowboy builders in all of Jerusalem. Because he worked for the tax people. Now, let me say, there are any tax people here? Okay. Uh, just in case you come across my number, and I, you know, I do pay taxes. I'm self-employed. I do pay taxes in that there, and I think you're an honorable person. So I am, I am in no way discrediting you as it works for the government or works for a tax station. You get their names afterwards. <laughs> it's okay. I got a woman in my church, and she's, she works in the tax office. So great people do work in the tax office, but not in them days. Not in them days. 
not in them days because they hired people of their own community and then they, they, they worked for the Roman government and they, they, they took exuberant amounts of money off their own people. But on top of that, because they were a privileged position, they were allowed to charge the people on top of that whatever they wanted. So these guys made a fortune of money about robbing their own people and defrauding their own community. So he's a businessman, but he's a defrauder. He had it all. He had power. He had prestige. He could mix with the, the chieftains and the, and the leaders of Israel. He could sit with the Caesars up in Parliament because they'd want to know what's going on. He rubbed shoulders with the best. He had everything. He had influence. He had power. He had prestige. For sure, he had wealth and finance and a securing income. But he had no satisfaction and he had no peace. Because if he had had satisfaction and peace with all his wealth and information, then he never would have come this way. The Bible said he was short stature. And so to see Jesus, he had to climb up a tree. And it's funny, out of all the people that the Lord could have stood with and stopped with, he chose him. He stopped underneath a rascal, underneath a con man, a con artist, just right underneath him. And he stopped long enough to say this. He said, Zacchaeus, see you knew him. I know who you are, Zacchaeus. I tell you what, Zacchaeus, he come on, head on down right now. We'll go to your house for tea. The, the mouths of the people must have dropped open. He said, I'm going to your house. They say, in an instant of time, Zacchaeus was changed. He came down out of a tree, came down, stood beside the Lord, and he says, I'm telling you what. He said, see everything I've stolen, I'm about to give back, and I've robbed, defrauded this man. If I have defrauded, I'll ah, ah, ah. Do they have to defraud? I'll pay them back several fold with interest. Change your heart. Change your heart, change your heart. Jesus never asked him for excuses or reasons why. He just looked at him and said, Zacchaeus, it doesn't have to end this way. Look at somebody say, it doesn't have to end this way. It doesn't, your life doesn't have to put a stop where you are right now. I don't care who you are, where you are, what you're doing, this is not the end. As long as you've got breath, you can still change it. You can write the end of the book different than the first. It doesn't matter who's decided what color that's going to be in. You're the one that decides it. You're the one that makes the decisions. And the day Shekhar left where he was, he repositioned himself for a miracle, got himself right in the face of the Lord, and in an instant, a change. Jesus going out into Jericho. He's coming out of Jericho. There's a man called Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus is blind. He's no chance of ever getting better, no chance of ever having a life whatsoever but he knows he's got one shot at it. And there's something inside him when everybody else is going to the same committee and saying, we'll never be any better. We'll just have a week club and we'll sit down here and we'll talk the thing through. There's something in Bartimaeus said, I'll not be at your club next Wednesday because I got one chance at this and life doesn't have to end this way. The chapters of Bartimaeus's book, this is your life. <laughs> The chapters of my book doesn't have to end this way. And he repositioned himself to get right on the face of the Lord. And he screams and shouts. You remember, he's coming up, the whole procession is coming up. So he starts screaming at the top of his voice. And there's people around him and they say, for goodness sake, Bartimaeus, keep, keep, keep it down. Bartimaeus, for goodness sake. And Bartimaeus had a few words and he says, listen, you can keep quiet if you want. You can keep quiet if you want. Go on ahead and shout or sit whatever you want to do. But he says, I get one go at this. I get one go at it. If this man passes me by, then the chapter will be written. He said, if I can stop him for a second, then it will not have to end this way. And he screamed and shouted, and Jesus pulled the whole procession to a halt and looked over to where Bartimaeus was sitting. Looked right over and said, I'm coming over you, boy. And he walked over. And he simply asked him, what do you want? Look at somebody say, what do you want? What do you want, Bartimaeus? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? He knew what to ask for. He said, Jesus, it doesn't have to end this way. I want to get my sight back. If I could get my sight back, I could, read, I could write this book different. And Jesus, the Bible says, he was immediately made whole. His life changed right there and then. There's some decisions that you'll make in life will change you forever. There's some decisions in this meeting that you can make will change you. 
whether to stay in the same job for another 40 years, whether to get up and go on, whether to go to Borneo, whether to sign up for YWAM. There's, there's decisions that you can make, honestly, honestly, honestly. There's decisions because it doesn't have to end this way. I'm